Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This morning we'd like to have you go to the DAU clinic and pack and carve a couple simple amalgams. We're going to utilize the dental assistant for this. In a way, this might be a little unfair to you because uh, if you get involved in this in an office, you may well have to do both the dental assisting and the packing and carving yourself. But we're limiting this to only about, well, less than four hours. It'll be between three and four hours of experience and we don't feel that you'll be able to get much experience in the packing and carving if you have to do all the dental assisting also. But we'll ask you to pay close attention to the dental assistant and what she does because uh, this may well be part of your job also, depending upon your situation and circumstances and that exist. One thing I'd like to reemphasize also at this stage is that this experience is an introductory experience into the packing and carving of amalgam, and it is by no way an attempt to make you proficient at the packing and carving of amalgam so that you may go out and do this on patients. There are places and states that do do this. The hygienist does pack and carve amalgams, but this will not give you adequate training to do it. You will have to pick up additional courses if this is your interest and uh, get additional training. This is just an introduction, and we hope it'll be a fun introduction, something that you'll have a, uh, some enjoyment out of. It'll also give you a good experience into understanding some of the problems that exist in polishing these amalgams, because the manipulation, the handling, the packing and carving, uh, all can rather significantly influence the polishing of these amalgams. And we're going to ask that the amalgams that you polish, t that you pack and carve today, that you also polish and that these be handed in as polished restorations. Now, your polishing on these can and should be handled in the clinic and we've made arrangements with the afternoon clinic staff for this to be done during pre-clinic time in the afternoon, particularly if you get a cancellation. They probably won't be required until along the end of the semester and with the uh, uh, cancellations and what have you, I'm sure you'll have time, but uh, you'll find that if these aren't condensed properly, if they're not packed or carved properly, you're going to have finishing problems and this will give you some respect for that also. Now let's take a close up of look of our instruments here and uh, we'll go over these with you to begin with. We'll try to keep the instruments used to as minimum as possible. You can get involved in many, many instruments, but uh, we'll keep them as small as we can. Let's take a, a close look at this first one here. Uh, many of the dentists medicate their amalgam cavity preparations before packing the amalgam, and we'll have you go through and place some copolite or some cavity varnish into this, which is the most common uh, material, I think, although there are many materials that can be used, and this is done with a small cotton plier and some cottons like this. If we look onto our pluggers here now, we've got four different types of pluggers, and we've got these set up in the order that the dental assistants are used to them, just labeled one, two, and three, four, but uh, you may prefer to call them a, a small round, which is the main instrument that is used, and then we come to a, a larger round, which will be a number two for the dental assistants, and then we come to a right angle one, which uh, is used in more difficult access areas which is a three, and we come to an ovoid one, which is more commonly used in interproximal areas, and I suspect we'll use this in the class two, but not today here. Uh, we'll go to our carvers, and the first one is a ward carver. This is used in the uh, class five, in the buccal surface, as well as the interproximal surfaces. We'll use this a little later. And then we come to our discoid and cleoids which have a round one on one end and a little bit of a cleoid on the other end, or a spoon-shaped air. We have a small one, which is a 5C, and a little larger one, which is our 7C. Then we come to a burnisher, an anatomical burnisher, which we'll show you how to use, and these will be handed to you as you are working, 
You may need to call for them, but probably the assistants will know about when you're ready for them anyways, and so they'll be pretty close to being ready even before you call. And then we have a carrier, which uh, we'll carry the amalgam actually into the cavity preparation with. Now, let's take a look at our alloy. We're going to be using the uh, Kerr Spear Alloy, which is pre-packaged. It's pre-measured, and just by pushing the top down, hitting the button, on it, we can set it into the amalgamator and then go ahead and start it mixing. While we're mixing on our amalgam, it's a good time to apply our cavity varnish. In this instance, it'll be our copolite. So we'll take this and just gently dap it onto the tooth a little bit. Dry it a bit. That's about all there is to that portion. Now we're ready for our amalgam. While the amalgam is being taken out of the little mixing device and loaded into our carriers, in this instance, the system will place it right into the tooth for us here. It's just a matter of taking it and packing it into position. Now, the sphere alloy doesn't require quite as much packing pressure as does some of the other types of alloys, which are fairly common. But nevertheless, we need to pack moderately firmly to get this condensed into all parts of the cavity. And we'll kind of take a step-like procedure and kind of walk from one end to the other on the restoration until we feel we have it fairly well covered until it gets up to the margins of our cavity prep. This is one place where it's good to have a, at least a small photographic mind because we're going to want to carve this alloy right down to the margins that we started with. So you'll have to look at your restoration fairly closely to begin with so that you'll know where those margins were. This is our burnisher. And at this stage, while it's still soft, we'll just go over and, and burnish the restoration. This helps to give us a better surface texture. Seven. We begin with our carving with a fairly large round type instrument and just take the excess off. Now if we keep this well onto the tooth surface, we shouldn't remove any of the excess uh, alloy beyond the margins. You'll find this the same with your polishing. Go to the five. Huh? If you're carving or polishing with a large round burr, the same thing applies. We keep this onto the tooth structure and we don't generally get involved in removing too much of the alloy at the margin. Now, for your purposes, we're going to ask that you just take and, uh, if you get along well, pick this alloy out after we've got it polished and to the point that you want it. Uh, and try it again. And you can do it two or three or four times if necessary until you get the, a good feel of it. And at this stage, it uh, wouldn't take much effort at all just to take the, possibly the pointed end, which would be the uh, cleoid end of it, and uh, pop the amalgam restoration right on out. And then you can go ahead and, and try it again. Because you'll have to pack and carve this within a matter of just uh, two or three minutes. And if you've got an hour or two, you could do several of them during that time. And this will pretty well clean right out for you. And you can go ahead and uh, uh, pack it up again if you want and get more experience. At this stage, we'll stop and uh, get set up and show you how to pack our, our class five restoration here. Before we insert our class five, let me review a couple things on this class one. After we had this carved, we could have taken a burnisher and gone back and reburnished our surfaces on this which would have smoothed them up for us quite a little. One thing I don't want you to do, and I, you may have noted that I didn't do, is put into sharp anatomy. Sometimes the students would like to take real sharp anatomy and place it in these occlusal restorations. 
this is a, a bit of a problem in so much as much of this uh, anatomy uh, becomes food retention and collection areas. And frequently a small area uh, rounded at the base of the anatomy is very adequate. Notice we placed in the copolite again. And we'll gently blow that out. Blow mm -hmm. out the copolite. And then we're ready for the packing of our amalgam again. Now here we're going to use this right angled plugger, which is just easier to get access into these class five areas. And again, you want to place fairly firm pressure on this and get it applied into all the angles and corners of your restoration or into the cavity preparation. One of the things we have to be rather careful with with our class five is that we rebuild our contour. And you may want to use the larger end. These are double-ended now. You may want to use the larger end to finish your packing and you'll pack along the clusal and we'll pack along the cervical at a little different of an angle. Make sure that we're building up and maintaining the height of contour on this class five. It's one of the most difficult areas to maintain. We've carved this practically completely with our ward carver. And we'll do this at two angles. One angle will be getting the cervical, and the other will be getting the occlusal. And again, you'll have to remember where your margins were on it, because we want to maintain the height of contour on this tooth for the health of the gingival tissue. But it doesn't take a lot of effort to get this car back. But if you lose that height of contour, then we'll just have you pop it out and place it again. After this is carved, we'll again may want to burnish it to get our final surface texture on it. We may do this with a Wesco burnisher here, which the assistants will also have for you. And this will just help to smooth the surface and give it the final surface texture. So you can see there isn't really a great deal of difficulty in doing this type of a restoration. It's a fairly simple one and uh, shouldn't take us much time. If you have the time available, we ask that you try to go back and remove it and do it again. So you can get as much experience in the limited time you have. I've got a little time left over, and so I'll let me go over some of the other details with you here. One of the things which we forgot to do, and which is very important, is to check the occlusion on any of the restorations that have an occlusal surface involved. And do this, we'll use some articulating paper. And generally, we place the articulating paper right over the tooth and close it and tap on it several times. And then we check for occlusion areas on the tooth. With a small class one like this, we wouldn't expect much of an occlusion uh, area on the tooth at all. We wouldn't want a large blue spot. And certainly, if we picked up a large blue area on the tooth itself, this would be an area that we had carved high and we'd want to reduce just a little bit. Now. We've also got some time. Let me go over this classification with you. You've been getting class one, class two, and uh, you may well be hearing MO and MOD and other terms used. I think in your uh, charting at school, you're charting by surfaces, the occlusal surface being, uh, I think, surface five and so on. Uh, this is done in offices where they charge by surfaces. Also, they can chart by uh, uh, the letters of the surface and sometimes uh, the occlusal surface will just be termed an O, and the mesial surface will be termed an M, the distal surface a D, and if you get a restoration that involves several of these surfaces, they may be called an O or an MO or an MOD. Uh, the buccal surface uh, out here sometimes is called facial, and uh, you may have that referred to as a B or an F, and the lingual surface is generally lingual all the way around the mouth, and uh, that will be generally an L if they're referring to it by surfaces. Now when we classify these teeth according to numbers, class one through six, this is the way we'll break it down for you. And, and I don't think it's essential that you memorize this, but it's important that you be familiar with it so that you know what we're talking about here anyways. Uh, a class one is generally an occlusal surface on a posterior tooth. It can involve the uh, occlusal third of the buccal or lingual but generally it's an occlusal surface on a posterior tooth. Class two is a posterior restoration generally also, which involves an interproximal surface as well as an occlusal surface. 
And that's generally class two where you have a, a mesial and an occlusal, or an MO, would be the class two type restorations. You'll be packing one of these later on, and we get involved in matrix and other applications with those. It becomes quite a little bit more difficult. Uh, a class three, we need to go to the anterior teeth. A class three, which I don't think you'll be involved in here, but you should be familiar with, is an interproximal of an anterior. These are generally the silicates or the composite or the aesthetic restorations. A class four involves both the interproximal as well as the incisal of an anterior tooth. And so we've got the two surfaces involved in a class four, generally an anterior uh, restoration. Your class five is the one that we did, which is on the buccal or the lingual surface, generally down towards the cervical uh, of our posterior te teeth. A class six involves both interproximals as well as the clusal, which would be a one, five, two, if you were calling it by letter, or it could be called an MOD, or it could be called a class six. As I said, this isn't something that we're going to hold you responsible for and test you on it here, but it's something that you should be fairly familiar with. Now, one of the other things I should try to help explain at this stage, and that is that the dental assistants are trained to work very efficiently. In fact, they're very highly trained in this area. And they're also trained to help the dental student learn to work efficiently. And it's going to be a little bit difficult for them working with you in this limited experience not to want to make you work efficiently but we're going to ask them to not be too concerned about the uh, method of instrument passing and some of the uh, methods in which you may uh, get your instruments back and forth which can be quite significant if you're working with a trained assistant as we want the dental students to do but we're going to try to concentrate your efforts actually on the packing carving sequence and not on learning to be efficient uh, workers with an assistant and the efficient instrument passing. But if uh, some of the gals do slip and start to say, well, don't move or hold still or do this or do that, it, it, it's part of their nature and part of their training. And uh, don't get upset or concerned about it, but uh, concentrate for your own part basically on this packing and carving experience. All right, we're ready to go to the lab. Let's see what you can do. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.